Okay, so let's get started. Uh, we are talking about central path method. And I wanted to make a correction in the previous class. No matter how you define your barrier function and your cost function, well, the cost function is C transpose x, your f of epsilon, no, f epsilon of x. should be C transpose X minus epsilon summation log of Xi, I equals one to N. So some people pointed out that I wrote the barrier function as negative of log of Xi, sum of log of Xi, and then I did C transpose X minus epsilon B barrier function of X. So it should be plus barrier function of X. Okay, so that's the small correction. And so what we were talking about in the previous class was at every point of time, so uh, let me draw the, the graph. So this is my central path, this is my x infinity, this is my x star at zero, which is the optimal point. And we are at some point in the space x and we want to get closer to the central path. This is the central path, okay? And then the way to do that is we want to minimize this function within the set ax equal to b, x greater than zero. And the way to do that was try to solve x bar equals arg min gradient f epsilon x transpose z minus x plus z minus x transpose second derivative z minus x a z equals to b. Okay, this is all the recap of what we were doing in the previous class. Um, we get x bar equals x minus one over epsilon x square c minus epsilon. So these were the expressions we got. And we want to go, so your x bar would be somewhere here, let's say. And we want to get to x tilde, where x tilde is x plus alpha x bar minus x. Yes, you had a question. Um, is, there, is that a x squared a transpose? Or oh, yes, a transpose. Yes. And capital X is? Uh, diagonal of X. Capital X is diagonal of small x. We rewrote this as X bar equals X minus capital X Q x epsilon, where q x epsilon was defined as c minus a transpose lambda over epsilon minus 1, 1, 1, 1, 1.
Okay, this is all a recap of what we did in the previous class. We also noted this fact that Q of X epsilon equals to zero if and only if X equals to X star epsilon. Okay. Yeah. Sir, are these five ones or is just n ones? These are n ones. So this is a vector in dimension n. So this is just one, 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 one. Okay. So one vector. Okay. So. So that's good. Okay. So we initialize the point within the set. Now we want to get closer to the central path, so what do we do? We solve this optimization problem iteratively in order to find x bar. We get x tilde, which is in the direction of x bar minus x, right? And then we went through this entire algorithm again in order to get closer and closer to the central path until this quantity becomes zero, because then we know that x is actually at the central path. So what we are going to do is, even though this is not necessarily a norm, it essentially tells us some information about how far or how close you are to the central path. Uh, we, we will, so I just want to, show one Newton step. Uh, eventually, of course, you are going to take multiple Newton steps, but this is not the final algorithm. That's why I'm not writing xk plus one and all that. Okay, this is just one Newton step. So what happens in one Newton step in this particular algorithm? Okay. So going back to the point, this is not a distance, this is not a norm, but we can view it as a way to understand how close x is to the central path and that's, that's a very good thing because I can compute Q of X comma epsilon by solving this equation, by finding the value, by evaluating this equation where lambda is given by this expression. Why is it not a norm? Why is it? Why is it not a norm? Oh, like I mean this is, this is just, so a norm requires three properties, right? Triangle inequality and blah, blah, blah. So this one just satisfies the first condition, which is positive definiteness. It doesn't satisfy, uh, it doesn't satisfy triangle inequality or, it's not clear whether it would satisfy triangle inequality or not, okay? Because there are too many nonlinear terms here. Okay. And therefore it's not a norm. Okay. So what are the things that we need to worry about so at every point of time, we need to uh, iterate in order to get to x star. So we need to pick alpha, and we need to pick uh, epsilon at every point of time. So an easier thing would be uh, to have a situation where alpha is equal to 1 all the time. So then we don't have to pick alpha at all. Okay. So we don't have to think about alpha x tilde would just become equal to x bar. So what's the second fact? So these are the new facts that I'm going to introduce. You can really think of them as theorem because it requires a proof, but we are not going through the proof. We're just going through the statement. Fact two, this is fact one. So if x is in s, Q of X comma epsilon is less than one, then X bar is in S and Q of X bar comma epsilon 
is less than or equal to Q of X comma epsilon square. Okay. So if my if if uh, okay. So what's the what's the point? I'm starting at x. I have a specific value of epsilon. So this would be my x star epsilon. This is where I want to go. And it turns out, uh, not it turns out, but Let's say I've ran some Newton's iteration and I'm sufficiently close to the to this central path. So my Q of x comma epsilon is less than one. So my starting point is such for this particular iteration, my starting point is such that Q of x comma epsilon is less than one. So I'm close to the central path. Then x bar is guaranteed to lie in S. Okay, so it's not like my x bar is going to be outside the set. Okay, that's not the case. X bar is in the set S, and it's actually uh, pretty close to the central path. So, if Q of if the norm of Q x comma epsilon is equal to, so if norm of Q is equal to 0 0.5, then norm of Q of x bar comma epsilon is equal to is less than or equal to 0 0.25. So it's actually much closer to the central path than the original point. So that's a good thing. What that means is I don't I can take alpha equals one because I know that I'm not going to go away from the central path if I pick uh, so yeah so there is one less computation to do, one less thing to spend time on, which is picking an appropriate value of alpha. So no Armijo's rule, no decreasing step size or any any funny thing, just pick alpha equals one and that works perfect. Because I know X bar will be closer to will be closer to the central path. Okay. So that gets rid of, so from that I know that I don't have to pick a value of alpha, so one less thing to worry about. Now I need to figure out how to change the value of epsilon. So then I have another fact, fact three. X in S, Q of X comma epsilon less than one, or actually less than equal to gamma. less than one, I'm going to pick delta equals gamma one minus gamma over one plus gamma, and I'm going to pick epsilon bar equals one minus delta over square root of n. multiplied by epsilon. So this is strictly less than one. Then this implies that Q of X bar comma epsilon bar is less than or equal to gamma. Okay. So now we know how to change epsilon. Okay. Now we know how to change epsilon. So what's the algorithm? So this is the short step method. Uh, 
So short step method. So I want all of you to pay attention now. What's the short step method? So short step method is I pick an initial point x naught. I run this Newton's iteration several times until I get q of x k comma epsilon to be less than one. Okay, so how do I write it? So let me write the algorithm. So pick epsilon naught run Newton's method so that q of x comma epsilon naught is the norm is less than 1. So we just pick different x naughts until that's the case. Yeah, so no, not different x naught. So we start with some x naught tilde. And then just keep running the Newton's iteration until you find an x naught that satisfies this condition. Okay, so I pick an x star epsilon. I start with some x. I have you okay x hat. So I'm going to use x hat to denote the initial condition. It's the rough estimate or rough initial condition. And then I ran Newton's iteration several times until I reach this point x naught. That's my initial point for the barrier method, which is close to x star epsilon, epsilon naught. And then we have x k plus 1 equals x k bar, where x k bar is the same as this x bar, where x is taken to be x k. And then epsilon k plus 1 equals epsilon bar k, where epsilon bar k is computed in this particular fashion. So how do we pick gamma there? So the gamma is, so gamma is just an upper bound, so you can just take gamma to be equal to the norm of this, right? It, yeah. it can be any upper bound, so right. you're not restricted. So how do we uh, know when this stops? Oh. Excellent point. So the question is, how do we know when to stop? We pick epsilon naught, we get closer to the central path, then we update the value of epsilon k plus 1, and then we get xk plus 1, and then keep running the iteration again and again. When to stop? So here is fact 4. I'm going to erase this part. x in s q of x comma epsilon less than 1 implies c transpose x minus f star f star is the optimal value is less than equal to epsilon n plus square root of n okay so this is the stopping criterion. N is the dimension of x, right? N is the dimension of x. So this is like, um, what was the camera with the other one? But the other one where you were, ex you, you added on dimensions until you had explored the entire space. This is more like, a, an approximation method than an actual optimization method, if that makes any sense. We're not, it's not a, 
we're guaranteed to be approaching the solution closer yes, and closer yes, and closer yes, every additional. Yes. So you remember that epsilon k is a decreasing sequence because epsilon bar is something which is strictly less than 1 multiplied by epsilon at all the time. So epsilon is a decreasing sequence. Um, it'll converge to 0 eventually. So whatever accuracy level you want, you need, to you need to make sure that your epsilon k reaches that accuracy level, and then you can terminate your algorithm. And the f star here is what expanded? F star is the optimal value, so F star is F star is equal to minimum C transpose X such that X greater than or equal to zero, AX equal to B. So it's the minimum value, not the argument, but minimum okay. value. Okay. So well, that statement gives us the V is bound on on the difference between Right. Okay. So remember that this is always going to be non-negative, right? Uh, because x is some point in the set and f star is the optimal value. So this is going to be non-negative. But now you have an upper bound in terms of epsilon. So let's say your n was equal to 10. So to give you an example, let's say my n is equal to 10. I want an accuracy level of 10 raised to minus 6. Okay, so I want my C transpose X minus F star to be less than or equal to 10 raised to minus 6. Then I want my epsilon K plus 1. So I, I have to run this iteration up to point K where epsilon K plus 1 or epsilon K is equal to 10 raised to minus 6 over 10 plus square root of 10. Okay. So I have to run my iterations until this time, until my epsilon k reaches this number, or at least is less than equal to this number. Yes. Okay, so it makes sense to me why uh, we would have uh, the uh, um, epsilon times the dimension uh, of what we're of, of the space we're exploring. Uh -huh. and why it's it's epsilon on times n? Why does the square root play in? So that's the uh, square root of n is the norm of this vector. Okay. So if you go through the proof, you will see that this vector appears somewhere with a square root, and that's what the square root of n is. Okay, and n would be the the norm square of this particular vector. So it just appears in that fashion, okay, in the proof. Uh, the entire proof of all these facts are pretty long. It's a six page paper, or six or I think eight page paper back in 1984. Remember, Karmakar gave the algorithm in 1984. So it's a pretty long proof. But at least the steps are clear. This is known as short step method. Why short step? Because you start with an initial point. You get close to the central path. Then you just take one Newton iteration. OK, so xk plus 1 is x bar k. So this will be your x1. This will be your x2. This will be your x3, and so on. OK? So you just take one Newton step at every point of time. Alpha is equal to 1. Epsilon k changes according to this method. And that's because once we get close enough to the central path, we won't deviate far enough away from it again yes. to have to run Newton's yes. multiple Yes, yes. OK. Uh, you could deviate far away from it if your epsilon bar was much, much smaller than epsilon. OK? So then you will deviate from Newton's method, but in this case, you just have to take one step and you won't go out of the central, out of the vicinity of the central path. Okay? So you're not exactly tracking the central path as is required for the barrier method. You're just within a small neighborhood of the central path and you're just tracing the path all the way to the optimal point. Um, and based on the desired accuracy level, you can pick a value of epsilon k and you can terminate your algorithm when your epsilon k is lower than 
that particular number. And given that you start your x0 is within the set S, you're actually never going to leave the set S as is uh, guaranteed by this fact. Okay, so x bar will always be in S and then some conditions will be satisfied. Yes? So uh, this approach, uh, which if we had uh, some space we were exploring that had like a million variables in it, uh -huh. no matter what level of accuracy we're willing to tolerate, we're going to have to get to an extremely small right. epsilon k to tolerate it. Is that going to be a penalty we have to pay no matter the method? Or, or is it just this, this method particularly that is inconvenient the larger space? OK, so that that's a good, good question. So the question is, if n is 1 million, OK, if your dimension of x is very, very large, uh, This algorithm will have to run for many, 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 many times in order to get an accurate solution. So what would you do? What are the ideas that you would try? Any thoughts? Have any of you ran an optimization algorithm with one million variables? No one? No one is working in neural networks in this class? Oh, wow, OK. Uh, that's good, OK. <laughs> Okay, nothing against neural network, but anyways, so in neural network, if you're training a deep neural network, you're essentially minimizing an objective function over millions or probably billions of, some people are now doing billions of, billions of variables, so n is of the order of one billion, okay? Uh, those people are in Google and Facebook, so it's not like graduate students in the university, <laughs> okay? Uh, but, 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 but yes, indeed, if you go to Google and Facebook, you will be running optimization problems with one, million, one billion variables. Okay, so n will be one billion. Uh, but anyways, to answer your question, you will change your accuracy level. So you don't want your accuracy to be 10 raised to minus six. You will be happy with an accuracy of one or two or five or 10. In which case, your epsilon k would still be of the order of 10 raised to minus six. In the sense that it is unreasonable for you to ask the algorithm to give you an accurate solution of the order of 10 raised to minus 6. Now, certainly you can ask the algorithm to compute it. Algorithm will compute it. It will just take too much time to get to that accuracy level. Um, it, the question was also about, are there other approaches that won't run into the same oh. error bound, or will this be a penalty we pay regardless of the method we're so, trying to use to navigate this space? So for the worst possible optimization, linear programming problem that you will ever face, this is the fastest method known. Okay. Okay. So this short step method is the fastest method known. There may be a few tweaks here and there, but if you look at just the exponent of how long it's going to take, it's of the same order. This one is the fastest one. Um, now the question, so this is the fastest algorithm for the worst case linear program that you might be ever given. But not all linear programs are worst case linear programs, okay? So, you have a question? Uh, how can we derive the, the, the fact, fact four, uh, C, Tx minus F star less than minimum? Yeah. Oh, so I want this number to be less than 10 raised to minus 6, right? So I'm just taking an epsilon k. So this is going in the denominator. That's here we, we didn't arrive at the optimal point. So how can we know that what that star is? Oh, this is, uh, what is the value of f star? So his question is, I don't know what f star is. So how do we get this bound, okay? Uh, I haven't introduced this concept of duality yet, but I will introduce, this la introduce it later, so you will know how to get an upper bound on F star. Um, no, how to get a lower bound on F star, which is how this equation gets derived. Um, that's a good question. Okay, so, uh, so what, sorry, yeah. So uh, then is there, there a different bound we could construct if we were looking at percentage error? 
percentage error would be what? This divided by F star? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, in which case you need to have some way of computing an upper bound on F star, so that will be from duality. I guess you can do it. You can do the percentage error computation also. Because uh, if we can and construct the bound on percentage error, the absolute error for right. discussion right. isn't anywhere near as useful. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's right. OK. Any further questions? So I'm known for Here, F star? Yeah. It's not known, but you can compute this bound. This bound is known. OK, this bound holds. As long as F star exists, which means the, the optimization problem has a solution, then this bound is, is what it is. I mean, that's, you can prove it, actually. Okay. And you said this was the fastest method for the worst case linear programming algorithm known. What would be the worst case is? No one knows. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, do we have uh, a metric of worst caseness? Um, no, basically what you do is you try to find an upper bound on the number of iterations you need to do and how many computations you will have to do okay. in order to get a desired level of accuracy. Okay, and that's how you compute the worst case bound. So worst case is not the worst case given, but it's just upper bounding the number of steps you're going to, you need to have, you need to take in order to get to the optimal solution. Okay, so this method it requires no constraints on the problem to be able to say it is the best method in the worst case. But if we were to construct a different method and say it works well, we would have to constrain the set over which things we would say for a linear program it works well and use that as a justification yes. for it not being the worst case. Yes. Okay. Okay. Now, so this is a this is short step because alpha was equal to 1. Now the question is, which many of you had asked in the previous class, why don't I pick epsilon to be very small number, take a lot of Newton's step to get to that point, and then reduce the value of epsilon very rapidly, and then take multiple Newton's step to get closer to the central path, and then again change the value of epsilon, and so on. So that's known as long step method. So in the long step method, what you do is, okay, so this is the long step method. So you start with some x naught, you take multiple Newton's iteration to reach this point, then you reduce the value of epsilon to be much, much smaller than this epsilon bar, okay? So, so then your, this is your x star epsilon naught, this will be your x star epsilon one. And then instead of taking one Newton step, since you have reduced the value of epsilon by a large number, by a large margin, you will have to take multiple Newton step to get closer to x star epsilon one. And then again, change the value of epsilon two to be, be, to be much less than this epsilon bar two and then take a few Newton step to reach x star epsilon two and so on. And this method seems to work well in practice, okay? But no theoretical guarantees on the number of iterations you have to take to solve this problem. What guarantee do we have uh, on that method that we're not going to go outside the set? That's this guarantee. So if your x is an s, and your Q of X comma Epsilon is less than one, then your X bar, which is the first okay. Newton step, that's going to be in S. Okay, so, so long as we choose the original point sufficiently. Well, Close to the central path. Uh, okay, uh, and then that doesn't change whether we're doing long step or short step. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when you're, doing, when you're doing long step, because you have reduced the value of Epsilon by a large number, uh, your Q of X bar comma Epsilon bar might be greater than one, and so you have to take multiple Newton step in order to get closer to the central path. Um, and that's what long step method does. This works well in practice, but no theoretical guarantees. The short step method works, no. It, I mean, it, it works well in practice too, but there is a theoretical guarantee on how many iterations you need to take in order to achieve a desired 
accuracy level. Okay. So that bound, that fact four bound, uh, doesn't exist for the long step method. Is that what you mean? No. This this method, this uh, number exists no matter which method you pick. Okay. So all these facts are irrespective of the short step or long step method. Is it that the long step method uh, can't have a theoretical bound put on it that guarantees it will work, or we do not have one yet? That the map has not been constructed? Okay, so um, I, w I would say that uh, maybe some people worked on it, but they couldn't figure out a bound. If you want to work on it, you may be able to give a bound on the number of steps you need to take. But so far, it seems like nobody has been able to understand how many iterations one needs to take, how many Newton's iteration one need to take in order to get from epsilon, in order to get from x naught to x one. Okay, so it's open, not proved that yeah. it cannot be done. Yeah. Okay. okay any question? So this is the famous interior point method for with logarithmic logarithmic barrier function for linear programming problems. Yes. How do we choose gamma there? Uh, since it's a this gamma? Arbitrary value. Is it arbitrary value between between this and this? Does it affect the the practical rate of yeah. Yes, it does. So for instance, let's say gamma was close to one. If you pick gamma very, very close to one, 0 0.999, then your delta is close to zero because you have one minus gamma term here, which means your reduction in epsilon is going to be much, much smaller. So, if, so for instance, if gamma was 0 0.99, then delta would be something like 0 0.01. Uh, or 0 0.005, and then this would be of the order of 0 0.995. So that's not helpful. Okay, you want to reduce the value of epsilon much smaller than this rate. Yes, so uh, ideally you want the norm to be close to 0 0.5, so that way your delta will be kind of optimized. And then your epsilon bar would be optimized if you want to use short step method. Of course, you can always go to the long step method, change the value of epsilon bar, I mean epsilon k plus one to be much, much smaller than epsilon bar k, right? 0 0.25 multiplied by epsilon, for instance. Uh, then you might have, then you will have to take multiple Newton's iteration in order to get closer to the central path, okay? And that's exactly what long step method does. Any other question? Okay, so we talked about barrier method in the context of um, linear programming. Uh, and barrier method is used for inequality constraint problem. So let's look at what happens when you have equality constraint. And we'll talk about augmented Lagrangian method next. So I want to minimize fx, x in set x, such that hx is equal to zero. Okay. So I define augmented Lagrangian as fx plus lambda transpose h of x plus c over 2 norm of hx square. Okay, c is a constant, c is not a constant, but c is something greater than 0.
this is known as augmented Lagrangian. This is the usual Lagrangian and then I augment the usual Lagrangian with this particular penalty <coughs> term. And this is something that you all, we all have seen it before, right? So uh, we've st seen it in the proof of Lagrange multiplier theorem. Um, so we are just adding a penalty for violating the constraint. And there are two approaches to decompose the original problem into a sequence of optimization problems for the augmented Lagrangian. So in one case, you pick a value of c which is sufficiently large and you pick a value of lambda which is sufficiently close to lambda star. Okay, lambda star is the optimal Lagrange multiplier for this problem. And then you might ask, I don't know, I mean I want to solve this problem, how do I know the Lagrange multiplier? Right? That's the whole point of using a numerical method. So I don't know anything about the problem, all I know is the objective function and the constraint and I want to solve the problem. So that method doesn't really work well if you don't know or if you cannot estimate the value of lambda star. The other option is to keep lambda to be some constant, I don't care whatever that constant is, and I take c going to infinity. Okay, So just like we took epsilon going to zero in this case in the barrier method, so the weight assigned to the barrier was reducing at every time step. Here, I'm going to increase the weight assigned to violating the constraint as time progresses. So option one is lambda close to lambda star, c sufficiently large. Option two is I'm going to solve for lambda, whatever, I don't care what lambda is, but just CK going to infinity, increasing to infinity. And the problem that I'm going to solve at every point of time is XK equals to minimum argument of LCK X lambda K, um, over x in capital X. And since you are taking, so what happens in the uh, so what happens in this case, all you want to do is minimize the Lagrangian over a set. Typically this set would be Rn, so you are essentially doing an unconstrained minimization of the augmented Lagrangian. But if X is uh, set like a box set or um, positive or orthant, then you can use one of those conditional gradient method or gradient projection method or uh, or some other method in order to solve this problem, okay? So the hope is this problem is difficult to solve, but solving this problem is comparatively much easier. And then where are CK and Lambda K getting calculated? Oh, so yeah, so CK, so Lambda K, is, if it is close to Lambda star, then you just pick Lambda K equals to Lambda star, and CK would be sufficiently large, so CK would be a constant. Otherwise, you let CK going to infinity, and then lambda k be whatever, any constant. Okay, so you're saying we, we generate a lambda k from, from solving the unaugmented Lagrangian? No, you don't, you, you are not solving any other thing. You just have, just like in this case, you pick the parameter epsilon k according to some rule, rule of thumb, and it would give you um, so eventually the, the theorem for the barrier method is xk converges to x star as k goes to infinity because epsilon k is going to zero. So similarly here, the 
the theorem is xk converges to x star, which is an optimal solution to the original minimization problem. Um, your, so all you need is ck going to infinity or and, and lambda k being lambda k being a bounded sequence. Okay, so let me let me write it formally. So the theorem is if lambda k is bounded and c k goes to infinity, then x k converges to x star. Okay, assuming that the algorithm converges, of course you can always write something where x k doesn't converge, in which case nothing happens. Okay, so now we need two things. We need to pick the sequence CK and we need to pick the sequence lambda K. In this case, in the barrier method, all we needed to do was pick epsilon K. So now you have two parameters to play with. There was a question? Yeah. So this is the usual Lagrangian and then you are penalizing violating the constraint. But how will you how will you solve for so let's say I give you an optimization problem with equality constraint and I ask you to give me numerically, not by hand, okay? You cannot solve all the problems by hand. So give me numerically a method to compute lambda star and x star. Okay, so what will you do? Let us assume that all points are regular, so you don't have to worry about regularity. What would you do? Okay. So what's the iteration for lambda? I can see why how you would do the x part, yeah. right? Iteration for x, which is x k plus one equals x k minus gradient of l k, right? How will you update lambda k? Any thoughts? Okay, you don't know what lambda star is. Okay, so somehow you need to update lambda k. And with the augmented Lagrangian, what I'm saying is I don't really need to update lambda k. Okay, I can just pick lambda k to be constant. I can let ck going to infinity. And I will have xk converging to x star. Okay. We'll get to it in a minute. Okay. So there is another expression which, if you evaluate, it will converge to lambda star. So uh, then, and if all we have to do uh, for x k to converge to x star, uh, why do we involve lambda k at all? We could just say it's zero, and then it's very. Yeah, I think you can. You can certainly. Uh, is it that? Uh, using certain sequences of lambda make the algorithm more efficient? Yes. Okay. It'll make it uh, converge faster. So his, his idea was very intelligent. You know, that's a very good point. So he said, I'm just going to take lambda equals zero and I'll just let CK going to infinity and then I'll converge to X star. I mean, certainly, yes, you can do that because the theorem doesn't preclude lambda to be equal to zero, but picking and picking a an appropriate sequence of lambda k would make your solution converge much, much faster than picking uh, some random value of lambda k, like lambda k equals zero for all k, okay? So that's the next result. What is an intelligent guess for, or intelligent update equation for lambda k?
So if I am doing this minimization at all the time for every value of CK and CK is increasing and CK increases to infinity, XK converges to X star, XK converges to uh, X bar such that gradient of H X bar has is full rank. So remember for regularity that is needed. Then lambda k plus one or lambda k plus c k h x k converges to lambda star as k goes to infinity. Where lambda star satisfies gradient of L x bar lambda star equals to 0 and hx star hx bar equal to 0. So these are the first order necessary conditions for optimality. Okay, and this is not an augmented Lagrangian, this is the true Lagrangian. Okay, so the gradient with respect to x of the Lagrangian goes to 0 and in the limit and then the x bar is a feasible point because it lies within the set uh, hx equal to 0. So now to answer some of the concerns, I don't know, I don't know the value of lambda star, so I cannot really pick, there's no intelligent way to guess what the value of lambda star would be uh, for a given problem. And so I have to start with some, some value, some random number, okay, lambda, to begin with. But now, and I'm letting CK going to infinity, I'm letting C, CK going to infinity at every iteration. But now, if I update my lambda K according to this expression, then I know that I'll get closer and closer to lambda star as time progresses and my convergence to x star would be much faster, okay? But which x star is this and which lambda star is this? Well, it's the one that satisfies first order necessary condition. Now, you have enough experience in optimization now to know first order necessary condition means nothing, okay? You have to check the second order sufficiency condition to ascertain whether a point is a local minimum or not. So, but most of the optimization algorithms only converges to first order necessary conditions. So that's what we have here. How complicated is the uh, theorem um, that given the augmented Lagrangian, we could make that statement about how lambda This one? Yeah. Pretty simple. Okay. It's not very difficult. Actually, now that I've covered the Lagrange multiplier theorem proof, it essentially is very similar to the proof of Lagrange multiplier theorem. Okay. Okay, you, you, you might want to take a look at it because it's actually very simple. Any other question? Okay, so we'll meet on Friday. Thank you.